today. It may have taken ages, but the waiting is over for Sega's employees. This is Checkpoint. Welcome to Checkpoint. Today's secret word is greedy. So when you hear that word, post a comment with its timestamp below. You won't win anything, but if you do it, you'll be helping us game the YouTube algorithm. A Game Informer interview with game director Juan Tae Kim has shed some new light on the upcoming Stellar Blade, the action game that certain questionable corners of the internet are holding up on a pedestal as an example of the based anti-woke Eastern game devs because the main character has shiny pants. Anyway, looking past the discussions of being inspired by Nier Automata and Sekiro is, to me, the most interesting part of the interview. The original, nascent plan for the game was simply to make a game that ends... When development began in 2018, and indeed still today, the Korean gaming market was focused on mobile platform live service games. The kind that just keep existing without stopping well, until they shut the servers down. But Kim and his team wanted to make a game that had an ending. And it's both funny and sad to me that this was notable enough to discuss. Beside all that, from the rest of the interview, the game looks fun. I might play it and not make it my whole personality. Public service message, that is possible. Anyone here ever play Myst? If you're like me, no, no you didn't. You booted it up because you heard you could run around the outside of the island and skip to the end. And then you tried that and it didn't work and you don't know why, but also you kind of don't care. But if you're not like me, you're gonna love this Animal Crossing New Horizons Island. Claire Hummel shared what she termed her obsessive little Myst Island on Twitter recently. And given what I know about Myst, I am assuming it's crazy accurate for two reasons. One, Paul included this story in the draft doc, and I know he's played Myst. And two, Hummel is the lead visual designer at Cyan Worlds, who we just talked about last week because they're remaking Riven, the sequel to Myst. There are so many great details on this island. For example, this space-time rift in a wooden walkway. And... All these pillars and symbols. And this bed with a bedspread. Boy, howdy, it sure is amazing how much I don't know about Mist. But I bet some of you think this is amazing. And that's why I love doing stories about things like this and also about Sonic the Hedgehog. Put on your hip waders. We're ambling out into the very unhip and waist high discourse that is Dragon's Dogma 2. The Triple D, if you will. Even if you won't, I've already said it. At time of writing, the Steam reviews on this hotly anticipated sequel are mixed. But that's an improvement from the mostly negative it was sitting at a little after launch, and for a variety of reasons. The main one centering around microtransactions. So we'll start there. Personally, I think asking for yet more money on an already full-priced game is greedy, but let's not have that argument. That horse sailed years ago. It is shady and should be worrying when publishers hide the nature of microtransactions from reviewers, whether it be adding the microtransaction store two weeks after launch, like some games, or just not allowing reviewers access to that information. Now, apparently, information on Dragon's Dogma 2 microtransactions was included in the review documentation, but I guess clearly not in a useful way because no review mentioned it. If microtransactions are a part of the game, they should be a part of the review, and publishers purposefully hide them because they know it will lead to bad press because people don't like them. All of that said, it's your money. Do what you want with it, even if it's to buy some really kind of useless stuff. And now at first glance, it appears like gameplay quality of life features like changing your character's appearance or even fast travel are being gated behind additional money. But in fact, all the items available for purchase in the Dragon's Dogma 2 Steam storefront are available in game and not even particularly expensive. And in the case of fast travel, which is probably the biggest point of contention in the Dragons 2 Dogma 5 discourse, that's not the case. Fast travel is rare in Dragons Dogma 2, which is an intentional design decision. It's baffling to me, but you know, go off. And fast traveling at all requires an item called a fairy stone. You can find them infrequently in the game. The microtransaction is for a totally different item called a port crystal, which lets you set 
a custom fast travel point. So it is not gating the ability to fast travel behind an extra purchase. Plus, you can only buy one port crystal, but it is still four Canadian dollars. I think it sucks, but let's at least be accurate when talking about dumb stuff they decided to do. Like how you can't start a new game if you've already started a game. Now, this is a feature that's been in RPGs since just about always, but not this time. Capcom has said they're patching it in. But right now, if you want to do over or roll up a new character, you have to go into the Steam files and delete a specific dot bin which is possibly easier than improving the game's graphical performance. Because apparently the number of NPCs rendered in towns is so taxing on players' CPUs that it's causing horrendous frame rate drops. And some players have theorized solving it through some light NPC genocide. Apparently, the game's quite good under all this other crap. It's Sonic's 30th anniversary, and what better way for Sega to celebrate than to guarantee all of their workers responsible salaries and job security. If you haven't heard, workers belonging to the Allied Employees Guild Improving Sega, or Aegis, have voted to ratify the collective bargaining agreement they've negotiated with Sega of America. That means Sega is now the proud employer of 150 unionized workers who enjoy benefits that not only include pay raises and layoff protections, but also things like continuing to work from home if they want, the ability to do other creative stuff that wouldn't end up belonging to Sega, and not getting fired for any reason as long as it's legal. See, California is an at-will state, and I've always wondered what that meant. So let's dig up a Wikipedia summary. <clears throat> In United States labor law, at-will employment is an employer's ability to dismiss an employee for any reason and without warning as long as the reason is not illegal. When an employee is acknowledged as being hired at will, courts deny the employee any claim for loss resulting from the dismissal. The rule is justified by its proponents on the basis that an employee may be similarly entitled to leave their job without reason or warning. And I gotta say, holy shit, you live like this? Canada doesn't have that. We have to provide reasonable notice of termination or provide pay in lieu. Anyway, I'm distracted. Want proof that unions work? This new union agreement was being negotiated, not even finished, while Sega of America was about to lay off 61 employees. And during the bargaining process, Aegis managed to save 18 of those people their jobs and negotiate more favorable severance packages for those being laid off. You'll also be pleased to hear that the union contract includes a commitment to crediting people on games they've worked on, including early QA testers, which might sound like the credit rolls are gonna get even longer, but I have a solution. Just name all of the NPCs in the next Yakuza game after Sega of America employees. It'll be a trip to run into a horny underwear guy and find out he's actually Caden Mossberger, assistant sound designer. You know what I could go for right now? A way to get off the good ship unbridled capitalism before it strikes the fuck around and find out iceberg it's currently steaming towards? I, I was going to say a latte, but y yeah. Coming up, if you're going to be in Japan and also hungry this April, Kyushu Railway Company is offering a Splatoon 3 bento filled with logos printed on nori, some stylish rice, and fried squid rings so you can still convince yourself of humanity's superiority, but only for a limited time. I was uh, definitely taken in by the initial round of Dragon's Dogma discourse. There's the, been a lot of it, has there? The triple D. Oh, yeah. All right. So what... The, I mean, it sounds like it. Yeah. The thing I saw a lot was before people understood what a port crystal does, which, again, seems silly and thought that it literally was like an item that let you fast travel. Yeah. Uh, it was being sort of sent with this headline clip from the game director saying, like, uh, games don't need fast travel. 
you just have to make traveling fun. Yeah. Right. Which is, I think, that's an ethos. Yeah, and that is an ethos. I, the original Dragon's Dogma came out over 10 years ago, and I think you should have fast travel mm-hmm. in a game of that scope. I've, I haven't, I have not played it. I have watched footage of it, and I was sort of going, I would go mad without mm-hmm. fast travel in this game. Mm-hmm. But uh, there, it's. I find it interesting because I'm gonna, I'm gonna be critical of a game that I enjoy uh, for this Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, where it's like we, we have this solved. Why are you doing this? So. In the game, you can ride chocobos around because okay. there's open world areas. Sure. There's it's not really open world, but there's like big sort of open worldy areas to explore, and so you can ride a chocobo, and you do the thing where you you call a chocobo and you blow a little whistle, and the chocobo shows up, and it does the thing that I think I think I first saw this trick in The Witcher Three, like it says Wark or something, or where no no you okay. just you blow the like no I mean that's the and, trick you saw oh okay no sorry I'm derailing the whole thing <laughs> it's fine. Um, Anyway, I think I first saw this trick in The Witcher 3 where it's like you you call for your horse in that game and wherever you are, the horse just sort of like walks in from off frame. Yeah. Right? So it's like if you're spinning the camera around, then it'll come in from an area where it couldn't possibly have been before. But if you just stand wherever you blow the whistle and it just walks in from out of frame and it's like, oh, okay. But it means that every time, you know, you blow the whistle and then you wait and then it walks in and then you got to walk up to it and you get on it. Yeah. Uh, and you compare that to like Elden Ring, which came out two years ago. Right. And you blow the whistle and you're just on the horse. Ah, yeah. Right. And it's so much nicer, right? It's anytime you need to call the chocobo, it's like, okay, get this and do the thing and do the, and the only reason it bugs me is because in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, the rest of your party is there. All all seven of them are also like there following you around as you walk around. How do they get around? Oh, as soon as you climb onto your chocobo, chocobos appear under all of them. Yeah. So it's like you're not trying for realism because the chocobos have just apparated under your party. Right. Why can't that happen for me also? Right. That's I find it very silly. Yeah. I, I I think that the the process of making a conscious decision to like multiple conscious decisions in order to engage in the kind of faster travel. Yeah. It feels like but I already said I wanted to do this. Yeah, it just it just seems to me like, okay, you've made a conscious decision that your game is not going to have fast travel. You're allowed to do that. I think it's a mistake. Yeah. Jeez, Graham, why do you hate Final Fantasy VII so much? I don't know, man. Yeah, I think I, it's a character it keep, flaw. It keeps hurting me. Yeah. And yet, and yet, here we are. Hey, here's another funny thing that we talked about doing, but we couldn't get a story together for. Oh, it. yeah, okay. Uh, was that uh, Call of Duty announced that <laughs> Cheech and Chong are coming to Call of Duty. Oh, perfect fit. I don't know who this is for because Cheech and Chong was before Us. my time. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, they're like, hey, Cheech and Chong are coming to it. And our friend Andrew observed that the tweet about the, the, the tweet announcing this was like uh, referred to it as like the dream rotation. Yep. And it's and <laughs> and as he said, dream what rotation, EA? Yeah. <laughs> dream what yeah. Say it. Yeah. Say it. Yeah. You put you put a little leaf emoji and a little puff of air emoji in there, and we all know what you're trying to say. Yeah. And you keep dancing around the edges of this, like, oh, aren't we being whatever? Weed is legal in Canada. It's not. It's legal in many places in the yeah. U.S. Cheech and Chong's whole thing is weed. You can just say it. It's not going to just act with integrity, EA. We just want you <laughs> to acknowledge the fact that cannabis culture is a really big thing, and it's making lots of people lots of money, and that is the reason why you're doing it, isn't it? You're like Either that or you're like, man, there's got to be a lot of disaffected 50-year-olds out there that are like, I love playing Call of Duty, but I also like getting real high or i like to also think about what it would be like if i was high when i was playing call of duty but what if i wasn't high but maybe my character was high instead all the time i yeah i actually literally don't know who this is for because my my dad's a little too old i think to to be the cheech and chong generation so i'm like i don't think it's for him so there's like a there's a, an, a window of Gen Xers who are like probably going to be real into it. I If you're out there and you like that, uh, greedy. Go ahead and there. Now you got a reason to put this in the comments. <laughs> oh, I did say it earlier. Don't worry. You did, yeah. It was in there somewhere, yeah. And Paul pointed out that like previously, Snoop Dogg was uh, added as an operator yes! uh, to the game. And not like not like the likeness of Snoop Dogg as like a tactical mercenary, but like... Much like 50 Cent. Actual... Well, we know from Blood on the Sand that yes. 50 Cent has actual combat training. <laughs> exactly. 
no but that it was actually snoop dog yeah <laughs> it's very funny i don't know it's just a very very odd thing did you have anything else i would love to say congratulations to sega of america for oh, yeah. acquiring your first union here's hoping for many more because I agree with an observation Paul made just before we recorded, which is that the the logo for Aegis should either it should have it should either have three fingers because it should be Sonic's glove. It's which I clearly think is, supposed to be Sonic's glove, but it's got a human number of fingers. Yes, and the fingers don't look right. Yeah, and so surely among your union is an artist. There might be there might be a, a thing though where they're like, well, we wanted to do Sonic's hand, and we realized that that could be copyrighted. Um, you know, Sega could take us to task for using Sonic's hand or some horse shit. Eh, I don't know. Uh, it could be like, oh, but we're the ones who make Sonic, and we all have uh, five fingers. I most of you, I'm on average have five fingers. I guess maybe um, less than five fingers on average. I guess probably. Um, so maybe that's what they want to represent, or maybe it was like. Tender Claws has their union. Tender Claws is a studio that uh, they they uh, unionized back in 2022, uh, and th they call themselves Tender Claws Human Union. And I'm like, maybe that is what's going on here. Is being is like another thing of like we need to reiterate we are all humans and we all have five fingers or almost five fingers, and therefore we need to represent humans in these cartoon gloves. And there's like one kind of hairy guy in the corner who's going like, yep, all human. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't count my fingers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely not in meetings with Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> uh, all right. I think that's good, yeah. Cool.